start recording. So, okay. So I want to introduce Daryl as you got, you guys probably know him a little bit from last year. Um, he has 30 years of experience in the consulting risk management experience in the environmental health and safety uh, field. He's been with uh, Braun Intertech for God, going on a year and a half. How's that been going? Pretty great. It's been yeah. Fun. Really fun. You know, <laughs> other than COVID, I guess. Yeah. So he's, <laughs> so he's, he's mainly in, uh, he, he's mainly uh, stationed or in Minnesota. Right. So he came down to Dallas to do the webinar and um, the weather probably is cooler here than it is up there. Probably. Not so. really. No, I left uh, Wednesday morning. It was near 80. Well, well, it's a, it, yeah, I had to wear a jacket when I got to Dallas. Yeah, it's uh, like sixty here, so we we like it. So, um, he says you're sounding pretty low, so I'm gonna make sure if I can. There we go. Okay, so um, so we have a lot of information to get to. So I'm going to um, let's just get to it. So Daryl, I want you to talk about what we're going to be talking about today. Sure. We um, and this is a little bit of a extension of what we covered last year. Um, which we kind of went into a little bit more detail on the hazardous waste world in the hospital and healthcare space or sectors. Um, and for those of you who have, you know, were part of that as well as are, um, are familiar with hazardous waste regulations, there's been changes at the federal level that are coming down or have been uh, promulgated. And then there's um, updates and adoptions at the various states, you know, at state level. So we're gonna kind of cover that today too, not in great detail, uh, but just sort of like the summaries of those things. The other thing is, you know, really how then these regulations and changes and hazardous waste regulations in general apply to the, what we call, or, you know, what would be not uh, traditional industrial sectors, such as retail or hospital or ed higher education areas. And you maybe define industry or industri industrial sectors as a heavy industry and refineries and manufacturers and things. Um, so, you know, regulations in, on RECRA and all the um, upcoming changes obviously apply to any generator of hazardous waste. And, and these sectors, the hospital, healthcare, retail, and higher ed, uh, are, are businesses just like the rest of, of, of those uh, generators. So they have to comply. And then at the end, kind of, we'll talk a little bit about some program management, you know, suggestions and ideas and sort of the lay of the land and the kind of the enforcement and regulatory climate as it is, you know, throughout the country and in some states today. And throughout this, we'll have some examples of some things and um, uh, should be fun. Oh, well, we've got a lot to, to cover, so. So we'll start with, um, you know, more of the, you know, the basics on the federal regulations. And it all started sort of in the 1960s of the Solid Waste Act, and which uh, translated over to the hazardous waste rules, which are the Resource Conservation Recovery Act. So that was, um, came out in 1976 from the federal government. It's been amended a few times, uh, and most recently in 2017, 2019, and then recently in February of 2020 with these um, with these particular ones. And we'll cover these in, in you know in throughout the slides here, um, as well as you know then the states have to go or some states or most states have to adopt or or change their regulations to comply with the federal regulations, and then we'll cover those as well. So that's sort of like the history of. Uh, what we're covering in terms of the hazardous waste rules and regulations, which all fall under RECRA. So what I've seen, this is sort of a slide, uh, probably more applicable to the hospital and healthcare industry, but it applies to parts of the retail and I'm actually part of the, uh, the higher ed institutions that have uh, uh, medical facilities. Um, and really it's just kind of, uh, this was, Part of this slide came from a friend of mine who is the facility director for I think five to six hospitals in the Minneapolis St. Paul area and she's a regional director and she's she just uses the word who is that what is that and it essentially the slide it, it's an acronym overload for these generated or regulated entities. We like our um, acronyms, that's for yes, sure. Yes, a lot of um, three and four letter uh, yeah, it's a, organizations. It's, a, it's an OMG situation, yeah. that's for sure. <laughs> LOL. Yeah, LOL. <laughs> that's what I'm here for. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, and part of this is uh, the word hazardous has a lot of different meanings in the regulatory world in employee health and safety for OSHA, uh, HASCOM, Hazardous Communication Standard, then the U.S. Department of Transportation 
regulates the world of hazardous materials and they define what that is and, and, and how it applies in the regulations surrounding that. Then in the pharmacy and the hospital world, you have um, NIOSH hazardous drugs are referenced in USP 797-800, which is something that healthcare and, and pharmaceutical industries is, is dealing with. And then we can't leave out biohazardous waste or infectious waste. So you, I would kind of loop, lump those together as regulated medical waste. <clears throat> and the main point is here, we get to the bottom, the word hazardous waste and the word words hazardous waste pharmaceuticals are are distinct and different from the other terms and definitions above. And in, in essence, you have to really manage these uh, re the regulatory areas independently. And uh, it's really kind of a challenge, especially I found in the hospital or the healthcare world is, um, you know, a lot of individuals and professionals in labs and nursing and pharmacy, they just think everything is a medical waste or it's everything is a biohaz um, or it's a hazmat. And you, you really have to kind of pin that down as what actually those are and what regulations apply to those and where they come from. And I think that's much easier. In fact, that's, uh, we'll use an example here later on as I'm helping a, um, a hospital in New England states with a inspection right now and, and, and defining these terms and how they should comply and need to comply is has been a challenge because they're they're kind of stuck in the world of hazmats or mm -hmm. biohaz and that's what they know. You had mentioned earlier about that things that might have been uh, a little different since COVID. Has that has that changed a lot? Or well, I mean, yeah, it has. Um, you know, in in the hospital world, it's, well, obviously, you think even for the retail business mm -hmm. as well. Um, the it, it, that's consumed a lot of time and resources. There's a lot of activities. Uh, extra cleaning and and monitoring, medical monitoring. You know which which patients they can have, what kind of waste is generated. I think to some extent it's kind of settled down in terms of the waste world. Um, I think when it first came about, everybody was thinking Ebola too, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, so everything is <laughs> yeah. an Ebola type waste. And in fact, uh, from what I know, and I'm not a bio infectious control expert, um, the COVID waste is kind of would be considered regulator, regular regulated medical waste mm -hmm. and can be managed in the current practices. Now, obviously there's some extra cleaning occurring, um, but it's not Ebola mm -hmm. too, you know, so that, that has kind of, I think, settled down a little That's bit. That's a good thing too. Yeah. So, so moving on towards the, uh, uh, these major regulation changes for RECRA, Hazardous Waste Generator Improvements Rule, was again in 2017. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Subpart P is the Pharma Rule and then Universal Waste uh, Aerosol Can Rule. The thing to understand again, and this is, I think we've covered this before, is the relationship between the federal government, EPA, and the state government is that uh, most states, except for Alaska and Iowa, have regulated authority. So um, Texas, for example, has the TCEQ is the regulated the authorized agency in the state of Texas. And in Minnesota, we have that too. Um, state and local agencies can be more strict and often are, probably most of them are, than the federal regulations. And I use some examples here and I think, um, and I think we used this last year because I, uh, in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, you have the MPCA, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency is the regulated, uh, is the authority, the local authority. But the counties in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area all have their own hazardous waste program and inspectors. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like who would come out and inspect a hospital or a manufacturer or any kind of generator in Hennepin County, for example, which is mm -hmm. where Minneapolis is located, would be most generally would be a, a, a local um, Hennepin County inspector. Uh, not the state inspector. They would maybe go to different sites and then rarely are the federal inspectors in Minnesota. If you're in Iowa, which is just, you know, right next door, you would never have a county or a state inspector for hazardous waste. They don't have any mm. programs. It would be a federal inspection. Gotcha. And in Texas, it would also obviously be T the TCQ. Yep. yep. I want to make a side note here. I changed the format of the slides right before we started. Wow. So um, just to let you guys know is that uh, I'll be cleaning up these slides. So when you, you when you can download them, uh, they won't be. I didn't. I was just noticing the slides. I didn't look right. at the picture, so I apologize. All right. That's all right. And, and none of this is uh, 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 proprietary information. So it's, <laughs> yeah. we'll clean it up. Um, 
so the, the hazardous waste generator improvements rule again came out in 2017. It, it fixed a few things in terms of from clarity and simplification, uh, provided some greater flexibility and management of hazardous waste. And now one of those was the, um, uh, you know, for example, if you're a, uh, let's say a small retail organization with 10 locations and one headquarters or distribution center, you could theoretically, if all your smaller locations are very small quantity generators, you could ship hazardous waste from those to the large quantity generator or mm. to the, uh, like a, a, a bigger facility. Um, it also addressed episodic generation, which uh, sometimes had triggered um, a jumping of one, like from a small to a large, if they had like a spill or they had a clean out or some activity occurred that um, put them over the limits for that month. Uh, and a few other things, which again, I, there's more to this than what we have on the slides and what we're covering. So this is for some of the basics. So where are we at with the, the current status of this? Essentially, um, as of this month, um, this is never, this is kind of a moving target. So it's always uh, changing. Most states have completed adoptions of, of the uh, hazardous waste generator improvements rules. Some states, several states are in a legislative review uh, or a public comment period or are drafting the rules. And then there's a few states that haven't really determined, they're either discussing internally what, how they're gonna implement or adopt these, or they haven't uh, indicated anything, you know, no action yet. Uh, in a nutshell, I mean, you probably could expect adoptions of legislative actions to continue through this year as well as into next year. Um, kind of the takeaway is, is on all of these, honestly, is, um, is to figure out if your location is in, um, uh, you know, Illinois, is to find out where Illinois is with, with this mm. regulation, okay? The same, we'll cover a little bit on the hazardous pharmaceutical rule. It, it defines, actually comes up with a new term called hazardous waste pharmaceuticals. This regulation pertains to management of hazardous waste pharmaceuticals in what's called healthcare facilities. And I've listed what, what that's defined as. Um, these rules are mandatory. They're not an option to the other uh, US EPA regulations. It became effective in August 21st, 2019. And you notice Iowa and Alaska are in there right away because they, again, don't have a state program. As soon as a federal rule and regulation is changed, this applies in Iowa and, and, and Alaska, as well as some other states that quickly adopted or uh, have adoption by rule. Um, a couple of things that maybe I'll go to the, the second to last bullet here. The hazardous waste pharmaceuticals, the, a key part of this is that if the facility and if the generator is going to manage their pharmaceutical waste in accordance to this regulation, uh, all hazardous waste pharmaceuticals, including the notorious acutely hazardous P-listed pharmaceuticals would not count towards the generator status, which is a huge thing. And then there's also was a change added to this uh, as well, kind of a separate thing about over-the-counter nicotine replacement therapies would be exempt from the P-listing. So be prior to this, uh, P075 was the nicotine waste code. Mm. And for over-the-counter nicotine patches, gum, and lozenges, they are now can be exempt from the hazardous waste regulations. Um, the, the caveat to that is some states may choose to be more stringent on this as they adopt this regulation. All right. Um, again, we, I know Lance said he'll move some things around. It's, it's, you know, everything's there. Um, so this came in again in 2019. Um, the authorized states have to move towards the August 2021 or August 22, depending upon if they have to do statutory amendments. Uh, current status, approximately roughly half of the states have completed adoptions or are very close to adopting. So that's sort of the lay of the land. Another 20 are in the kind of the process of doing that. And I think there's a handful of states that have uh, either not decided anything or there's no schedule or haven't really indicated what, what their activity is. Um, kind of a key takeaway again on the bottom here is, you know, if you are a facility or let's say a national um, pharmacy retailer, you know, is to know what is the status of that particular role in the state or location where you are. And then you can figure out whether how to comply with that. All right, the next one, um, 
universal waste aerosol rule kind of in nutshell. Um, basically, this is intact aerosol cans that are either listed or characteristic hazardous. Um, and it also included a section addressing leaking or damaged aerosol cans. Uh, this rule um, allowed non recra aerosol cans could be managed as universal waste aerosols too. That would probably make it easier, you know, rather than having to determine which is which in some cases, is to just, you know, manage them all the same way. One of the things about this regulation is the rule is less stringent than past regulations from the federal level. So the states uh, don't have to adopt this. Um, but what we've seen so far is it's this is moving pretty quickly. Um, a couple of reasons for that is um, some states had already um, had already had already had aerosols in their existing state universal waste regulations. So it's easy to just um, continue the way they were going. And so again, we we think this is going to be moving quick, quick more quickly than relative to the other the other ones that are going to take a little more time, which are probably more complicated mm. to some extent. And if you think about what you know, where the universal aerosol waste rule would affect in terms of the um, the industries, probably everybody. I mean, who doesn't have these, right? Um, and if you think about the retail industry, if they're especially on the sales side, if they're selling these and it's damaged, this you know, this could this could be this could help reduce their generator status. Have you seen like the agencies that are um, regulate, regulating this? Have you seen kind of like maybe a, a little bit more of a uh, grace period with um, with the COVID stuff going on? Yeah, like I, bigger fish to fry right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. And then, in fact, that's um, probably that's throwing a little monkey wrench in the timing of mm -hmm. individuals because you know, like a lot of industries and us included, we maybe were um, working remotely. Uh, you know, I've, I've spoken to regulators who haven't been in their office in six months. Yeah. Since March. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so, you know, things are probably head dragging along a little bit more than, than normal. Mm -hmm. Um, and, 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 uh, and then in the, you know, obviously in the hospital world or healthcare industry from a, you know, having the resources that just to, just to deal with COVID in general, other than the regulatory area, mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, taking some other time as well. So, you know, we come down, what would be, you know, bottom line, what, why is it important to be compliant with the hazardous waste regulations? Yeah, um, kind of probably the main thing is the super fund or legal financial liability, because essentially these wastes are always the generators. Um, cradle to grave means it's generated somewhere and it's destroyed or disposed of some other place. And throughout that whole chain, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's, it's owned by the, the generator. Um, you also have organizational risks, which can include fines and consent orders, stipulations, agreements, you know, NOVs, um, or in fact, if, you know, worst cases, it's become some publicity, like you're in the paper that, you know, XYZ hospital, which is, you know. That's not a good way to find out, by right. the way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, well, you think, well, maybe, you know, they should know what they're doing or, but again, they're going to have inspections. Uh, they're going to, they have a program and. There are compliance regulations and requirements, and you have to meet those. The kind of the bottom line here on the uh, the last bullet point is in the especially in the hospital uh, organization or structure or sector is you have third party or other accreditation and compliance organizations that are are pretty keen on knowing that you as a business, you as a generator, comply with these regulations. Uh, they're not necessarily the agency inspectors; they are. Uh, Primarily there, a lot of them are for the uh, centers of Medicaid and Medicare services funding, Medicare mm -hmm. funding. Um, and there's a lot of standards and other requirements that these locations have to comply with. Uh, so they maintain uh, and don't lose uh, funding from the federal government for, for Medicaid, Medicare. All right. Um, kind of a lastly, and for their updating or regulatory world is where would I turn? And this is, these are actually links that I use for questions on any of these regulatory changes. Um, one of the, one of the, I think one of the good things about these websites is they also, I think most of them or several of them have the links to the state agencies as well. So you can literally click on, you know, the federal one, and then you can scroll down and you will have the various states and it'll give a, uh, either a summary or a link to that state agency. 
so that you can determine, drill down basically and see what, what is the status of these particular, you know, regulations changes. Yeah, and most of them, in, uh, you probably already said it, but I, I was like, even though the EPA has them, you need still need to check state and, and local out obviously yeah. for, for different changes, yeah. Yeah, and um, kind of what we talked about too is there's, it, there's a little drag on updating, you know, some of these changes in the, the, the for example, you know, a, a state may adopt this and pass it, um, and they they don't get around to updating their website for a month or two right. or three. So you, you know, sometimes it's worth a phone call. Okay, um, so onto the what we call you know wh why why are we looking at what we call the non-industrial waste generators? Well, and in reality, they can be as complex as um, as the bigger generators. In fact, in, I, I would say in some cases or some reasons why they are more complex. Um, so, you know, part of it is the, they're either users or handlers or they consume or they purchase hundreds or even thousands of hazardous chemicals. And some or many of those can be uh, waste that are have to be dealt with. And, um, and if you add in, for example, um, um, the retail industry or even there's hospital systems with, I think I'm working with one that has Close to 200 hospitals and another 4,000 offsites, maybe 2,000. Wow, um, across 15 states, um, and then in the retail world, there's obviously there's national retail organizations that are in every state, with thousands of locations. Um, so mapping where those regulations are and how they're changed to each individual state and each individual uh, building is 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 enormously uh, hard to do it's mm -hmm. just it's just a very tough challenge to deal with and then i, I probably had this slide from last year you know sort of the the hospitals and what makes them complex waste generators and if you use these sort of numbers um and i think these are i i've been in i'm thinking 250 hospitals um and it's hard to pin this down. Like mm. How many exact chemicals are in your building? Well, these are ballpark ranges. And you know, you take a, um, a Dallas-Fort Worth metro area major medical campus, it might have double or triple the number of these in, mm. in the building at any given time. And uh, so it's, it's very tough to, to know what's in your building from a chemical standpoint, and then which of these and which combination of these in some cases are the actual waste that are being generated. And then if we kind of roll into the higher education campuses and systems and kind of like look a little bit similar to the hospital campuses in some respects. Um, but they again, they handle and use thousands or hundreds of different chemicals. Um, I happen to was looking into um, inspections and notice of violations in uh, uh, university or higher educational campuses and I found this one. So I kind of use it as an example here. Um, this, this particular uh, um, example is uh, a large state university with 50,000 plus, actually it's quite a bit more than that I saw, uh, enrollment with numerous labs throughout the campus. And I found striking over 2,000 satellite accumulation areas. So that would be 2,000 locations where hazardous waste is being generated. Mm. And I, I'm just trying to fathom how to keep track of that. Um, I would say in a hospital, you might have, a, let's say a 300 bed hospital, you might have 50 to 200, mm. maybe 50 to 100. And hopefully not one person's just responsible for that. So how would one? Uh, yeah, I would, <laughs> I would, I would think that that would need a team for sure. Yeah. And, and then um, there was definition, I kind of read the narrative here, but about one hazardous waste collection center is sort of where all the waste goes mm -hmm. and then uh, three waste management units. And what's interesting is they listed 26 active hazardous waste streams. And the, I want to point out that that doesn't necessarily mean 26 hazardous wastes. It could be some of these waste streams are a lab pack, mm. you know, like for example, um, flammables. T001 flammable waste from a variety of labs might all come into one location and they put it in a 55 gallon drum and ship it out that way. It could be mixing things that are the same, uh, can be mixed together, you know, all is flammable. 
So that waste stream might be, you know, uh, alcohol lab waste, and it comes from multiple locations. Um, I also noticed that this particular hospital was a large quantity handler of universal waste, which would be the used bulbs and batteries and pesticides and mercury containing equipment. Um, so that's, uh, it, it's, you have to be a big facility or campus to be a large quantity handler of universal waste. Wow. And, and then obviously at that level, then there's some compliance requirements that are attached to that. So really this could be any, I mean, it could be any college. In, well, this is, or, yeah. In I, Texas or actually, or the, anywhere. Yes. The, this, I think this is a, a pretty standard description of what you would see at a, at a college campus. And you, and you can, you know, if it's only a 5,000 person, you know, community college, it's not going to have anywhere near this. Right. I mean, the larger you are in terms of a state college or um, research and development or, you know, that sort of thing, or the, you know, you have a, a whatever a niche in the, um, you know, chemistry or, you know, um, um, whatever, some other industry that might have unique labs, then, you know, that would apply here. And then again, at the bottom here, I sort of listed some of the compliance violations that included missing waste determinations. Not really not, not to, you know, unexpected type findings for that size of facility. And in, in, a, in a college like that, who would be the ultimate go-to to find the answer guy? Like who would be ultimately responsible well, for this? Well, the, uh, the uh, in general, and I had this at sort of a wrap at the end, in general, what I've seen in the, what I would call the higher educational institutions, like the larger systems, is there are individuals, there are EHNS, environmental health and okay. safety type individuals or teams or leaders that this is part of their wheelhouse. Okay. Um, and in fact, in some cases, they even have, you know, technical services individuals that are HAZWOPER trained, you know, they can do lab packs, they know how to do manifests. Uh, that's what I've seen in that industry. Mm -hmm. um, I think even to the extent that uh, educational institutions have run medical centers. Mm -hmm. I think there's some overlap in that as well. I mean, they're, they, they have, it's sort of a unique fit of both of these mm -hmm. where they have some EHNS capability and, and expertise. And, and so I think things are pretty well run. Um, but again, they, there's changes and there's, and then you still have to adapt to the new regulations and that may change what you do in a, in a process. So, you know, turning more toward the retail sector, you can imagine how diverse this sector is, you know, from one mom and pop type locations to, um, you know, mm. 5,000 stores, you know, home improvement locations mm -hmm. with their hundred and whatever number of distribution centers. Um, so what do they do? What do they handle, sell, use, you know, a lot of different hazardous chemicals and you kind of fall into the same um you know, pit is that you have these kind of waste then, because if you can't, if it's damaged or it leaks or it spills, you you can't put it on the shelf and hope Lance French comes up and picks it up. Right. You know, you're not going to want it if it's got a dent in it. Yeah. And actually, and if it does spill, you need to make sure that the person that is handling the spill knows what they're doing. Otherwise, they just. I hope so. Yeah. Because <laughs> otherwise, you know, you spill some paint in Home Depot and then you just put it in trash. That's, that, you know, that's a, uh, you know. I'm sure these places have like entire aisles that are hazardous waste if if they got out yeah, well, or and, spilled. Well, in, you know, any of the, like the paints areas or the um, cleaning products, um, if you're a retailer that has a pharmacy, you know, you've mm -hmm. got that angle as well. Um, there's just, it's just, it's kind of a monster. I yeah. Mean, there's lots of different things. So the kind of the couple of last points here is that when we covered Earlier, the uh, hazardous waste generator improvements rule, the farmer rule, the universal waste aerosols rule, all these things are sort of adapting and changing throughout the country at different schedules. If I'm a retailer with 5,000 locations, how am I keeping track of my generator status? Because all of those could change, the adoption of those regulations could change what I'm actually doing. Mm -hmm. um, and then standard, standardizing a program, which ideally that's what you'd like to do. You know, if you're if you're one retail location in one state, it's that that's pretty easy to, to figure out what you're doing. If you have to now figure out for 50 locations, you know, and then you add in like where I live and work in Minneapolis, St. Paul, the counties there have their own program. Um, you gotta you, you have these are all the things that you have to kind of factor in. 
It's, it's, a, it's, it's a very tough challenge. Um, I just threw this in more to kind of give a, a, a feel for the um, hazardous waste or types of hazardous waste that are generated in chemicals. It's a, again a laundry list, depending upon what kind of, you know, if you've got a, if you're a pool supply company, a pet store, um, yeah. everybody's got cleaning products or personal care products, you know, like some of the, 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 the perfumes, uh, some of the hair products, uh, and again, the pharmaceuticals. And I think I throw in what I would call the operational waste, you know, actually running a building, or if you have a distribution center, what are things that, you know, you could regenerate there that have to be um, factored in. All right, getting more towards the, uh, um, the what I would call the, this is sort of my five-step program uh, to <laughs> trying to unravel um, hazardous waste. And I think I've used this before, but I, I bought a book called, um, it's almost like a recra for dummies. Um, and, you know, and it's, I think it's like 1,200 pages. Whoa. Yeah, because it goes into some interpretations. I'm sorry, dummies won't read that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually. Uh, I mean, I speaking for all the dummies out there. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, I've, I've brought that to some training sessions sometimes when they, if someone or an organization asks me to do recra training for 30 minutes. Oh, and I, yeah. So I bring, okay, here's the record for dummies. That's 1,600 pages. Where do you want me to start? Yeah. Uh, and what we're covering today is just a tiny part of this. And I, again, I, I, part of what I, I said earlier is I want to focus on sort of part uh, identifying and evaluating the waste because I think that really is the primer for all the rest of this. And I call it step 1A and 1B essentially is identifying what waste you have and then going through an evaluation or what we call a waste determination process so that you know which of those wastes are RECRA and which are not. And then, so that is sort of the step one, and that's a prerequisite to all the other steps. Um, by doing this step two, you, you then have an ability to understand or guesstimate mm -hmm. your volume of each of these on a monthly basis, which then you determines your generator status, you know, large, small versus very small. Um, so, I, and what I'll cover here in a second is sort of the federal, you know, game plan. Mm -hmm. And you have to don't discount what the states have, because uh, I mentioned earlier about Minnesota. Um, maybe, I, maybe we were talking about it, but mm. a a waste from a retail pharmacy in Texas uh, would be non-regulated, RECRA. That waste could be hazardous waste in Minnesota because their rules are different. And Minnesota has more strict rules than Texas. Interesting. So same same exact Walgreens, yep. different okay. Yep. Different standards. Okay. And regulations. And then there's once you know what your your you identified your waste and you've gone through the waste determination process and you've at least taken a best shot at what your generator status is, then you do the rest of these, like two, three, four, and five. Collect and store, train employees. Uh, and I'll cover a little bit more on training because I, I think that's, I wanted to do that. And then there's documentation, inspections, and then spill response, things like that are part of the, the program. So this is sort of a quick, uh, next slide, waste determination process flow diagram is, and again, this is the federal sort of process is, you know, you kind of go through this chart, uh, listed waste versus characteristic. Um, and if, you know, and we could have literally, we could go for days just talking about listed versus characteristic and how to figure that out. Um, but this is sort of the, the, the menu and the flow diagram of, of doing this for each of your wastes. And the next one, I think I used this last year. I kind of modified it a little bit, but um, one of the ways of doing a waste determination of your waste is generator knowledge. And generator knowledge is the individuals who are working with that waste or chemical, right? Um, and this, let's just use this as an example. So this is an example from a department, a real department at a large hospital uh, lab that I was in. Um, and kind of some background, they had never had an inspection for RECRA or waste compliance by either the state or the US EPA ever. Uh, they have never, they had never generated hazardous lab waste. Um, this particular analyzer, it, it, um, it, it does a, a blood serum um, analytical uh, work. 
and there there is a cleaner that's used I don't know if it's once a day or once a week, but there's a schedule for cleaning this particular instrument. And the cleaner is isopropyl alcohol at 60 to 80% isopropyl, isopropanol. Um, and the cleaner waste falls into a, what I call a jug or a plastic container underneath the machine. And so I walked up to the machine, I opened up the cabinet and I asked the technician, what do you do with this waste? You know, because it, mm -hmm. it said, it said a waste bucket. It was, I remember, and I asked what waste goes in there. She said, well, that's the, from the, I thought the sheer guy. Um, that's the waste from the cleaner. Okay. When, and they said, when it fills up, we walk over to the sink and pour it on the sink and we put the container. That's back. like, yikes. Yeah. Um, so I start scratching my head and going, well, do you know what's in the cleaner? And, you know, no, no answer, no response. I said, so then I start thinking to myself, um, do you have a, operations manual for the book or you know for the machine and sure enough they did and they found it it was uh up on the shelf you know the three ring binder blow the dust off does. of it yeah, yep. yeah yeah and i took a picture that's the upper right hand corner there a picture of uh the disposal section or part of the disposal section and it says i underline it it's spent isopropanol waste is considered a rec flammable hazardous waste therefore this material needs to be collected as Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, next thing I think is, well, it's a product. They buy this product, this cleaner. Do you have a safety data sheet on it? Oh yeah, we have that. And then we dug that out and I snapped the section 13, which is disposal considerations for this isopropyl cleaner, isopropanol cleaner. And if, you know, it's kind of small there. I did it, you know, I blew up as large as I could. Uh, it's flammable hazardous waste D001 needs to be managed that way well and i'm with the safety director of the whole system i'm with the lab managers i'm with the facility manager i'm with the technicians and they're feeling like really bad mm -hmm. you know i'm not trying to put anybody sure. under the bus but this is this is a pretty easy one um it says right in their own operations how to deal with this but in essence since primarily because no one had ever asked them they were just doing the thing that they've always done uh, it in in essence, and from the moral of the story, this is really easy to collect. It's not that hard to manage. Right. It isn't going to break the bank in terms of cost, but it is the proper way of collecting and managing this waste. And if you get caught and they decide to find you, then that could be right. Very much. So, what once an individual or a generator goes through that process of, you know, identifying their waste and then determining uh, the volume and which ones in doing that waste determination process, then you got to figure out your generator status. So this is really a key to knowing what your compliance requirements are. Um, because if you fall into the large quantity, you have the most compliance requirements. And small quantity is the middle and kind of the very small, which is the new word from the federal, you know, um, changes. Some states still use the CESQG kind of acronym um, because they haven't adopted the, the generator rules yet. So um, not all of these are exactly the same in some states. Some states have more strict definitions of what's a large quantity generator. Mm -hmm. So you have to sort of know that too, but this mm -hmm. is the federal list. All right, I said I kind of cover a little bit on RECRA training. Um, and so there are, it, it, um, there's no sort of set RECRA training. In fact, the federal regulations on training are kind of, uh, they're not very prescriptive on what it actually means. And why I think they did that is they really kind of forced the generator to figure this out themselves. Like wh who needs what training and why? And sort of this goes on the bottom here is um, if you were building a new facility, like I said, mm -hmm. and, um, and you know, you have, you know, you're going to have waste. How would you design the program? Well, I, you know, I would probably train the management of that facility on what is all of RECRA, right? Management level. Mm -hmm. And then how does it apply to our building? What do we do first? We do, okay, identify waste, do waste determinations, uh, figure out generator status, find containers, store them right, you know, train mm -hmm. employees, what? Well, we train employees on their job duties. Um, so the kind of the easiest thing to think about is in terms of like a hospital, like a nursing, mm -hmm. right? It, 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 nursing can be as simple as what is hazardous pharmaceutical waste and what container does it go into? Yeah, because that could save you a lot of money. Because if you're putting non-hazardous waste in, like if you just don't know and you're putting it yeah. in, that, oh, yeah. I mean, that I'm not could, even getting to that. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, that could 
just to save money part would be be great. I am always thinking about that part. But. Yeah, it reminds me of um, where I was earlier this week out in the New England state. Um, the pharmacist was indicating to me of looking like going and doing their own little self audits of their containers, pharma, mm -hmm. hazardous pharmaceutical waste containers. Uh, and they're finding lots of stuff in there that doesn't need to be in there. Right. And that's... Yeah. And it, so it's just compounding it. And if and part of it is they... In, no, no, no offense to what they did, but they kind of created their own way of doing something. But they didn't really think about how to do the training to the actual generators of you know the nurses. Yeah. Because if you don't know, if you have somebody you don't know, I don't know if this is hazardous or not, it's better safe than sorry. Well... I mean, well, that's probably what, yeah, yeah, but. But better safe than sorry was good for the odd thing. But right. for the standard stuff, you know, we don't want to be collecting non recra Absolutely. Hazardous yep. waste in recra containers. Right. Um, so this is a really a key thing is that uh, I, I, I kind of, I, 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 I disconnect what I call program or sort of strategy development implementation level training for a team or a mm -hmm. leadership versus the employee training of a staff with duties. Right. If the staff duties is I move a hazardous waste container from point A to point B, that's all I do. I know what's in it. That's my training. Mm -hmm. uh, I do not need to know how to do any reports. Mm -hmm. I don't have to do uh, waste determinations. You know, I don't really care about my generator status because that's someone else is dealing with that. Mm -hmm. So it's really a function of what is the person's job. Right. And and that's it's really I I, I can this probably is complicated in the retail world as well, because mm -hmm. you know, um, pick a store, like a. So everybody's going to be dealing with some kind of ha some kind of hazardous material. Well, if you yeah. work, I mean, it's just the way of you know way of it is. But you just have to know how to how yeah. to. And many times there's an online version, and I know some of the waste companies have you know you can do subscriptions or you yeah. can do online portals to do that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do a shameless plug here. So this we. Most of our listeners probably know that we always offer a RECRA management training, um, and we do it usually do it in three different cities: Dallas, Houston, and then uh, San Antonio and Austin. Um, but this year we're going to do it all, because of COVID. We're doing it online, and we're doing it. In, and so it's going to be in mid October. And if um, I'm going to have Lydia actually uh, put that on the letter of the email that we send out to you guys, so you look at. I mean, we're talking. It's seventy five dollars, and if you know that, I mean, that's an amazing price. And this is for people that have they already kind of gone through record training. This is because they're a refresher and you have to do it every once a year. Cause that, so, but uh, it's um, yeah. So well, and that, that'll go into much more detail yeah. on all these topics. Yeah. And yeah. so it, it's an, it's an eight hour course. And so, but uh, for, for the price, um, because it's usually, we usually do it for like, you know, $399. So. So there's my shameless plug. Right. There you go. Sorry, I had, I had to throw it in there. All right, uh, this and we're getting close to the wrap up. Um, sort of what it would be a non-compliant, you know, hazardous waste program. Well, there in in general, regulatory oversight for these particular sectors has been increasing. Um, it, you know, I've seen it in the hospital space for sure, and and then in the retail, yes. I mean, there's been some large settlements and other things that are you know are easy to find. Um, so, it, you know, what is happening under the regulatory scrutiny, that really varies from state to state. So, you know, a, and I'm kind of go back to the hospital world, the, this, the one where they had the lab waste had never seen an inspector of any kind ever for hazardous waste. Um, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, where I live, the counties go to every hospital every year. So it's you can imagine their programs for hazardous waste are way more fine tuned, mm -hmm. and no upsets, uh, hardly any kind of violations, you know, an odd thing here and there, but pretty much runs on its own, and people know what they're doing. Uh, if you go to a state that has never had anybody there, you know, you you never know what you're going to find. Um, so in inspections can be, you know, if you know about the environmental auditing world, you know. There can be RECRA hazardous waste inspections. There could be full environmental compliance, like Clean Air Act and Stormwater and you know EPCRA and all these other you know federal regulations. Um, we're going to talk a little bit later about desktop and virtual, which I think are are pretty common right now. 
And what I've also seen in these particular industries, you know, the these industries we're talking about is the uh, um, uh, associations are taking some leadership. In fact, um, uh, I often go to the what's RELA. RELA is the Retail Industry Leaders Association, and it's an association that supports that industry. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the big retailers are part of that. And, and there's excellent information on their website in terms of compliance information, hazardous waste, you know, status of various regulations and things. So that industries are, are picking up the pieces here. Uh, in the hospital and healthcare world, there's the professional associations. I'm a part of a couple of them. Um, the facility engineering side and the housekeeping and EVS side. Uh, higher ed has, um, one is called, um, the Campus Safety, Health, and Environmental Management Association, which is basically an association of professionals, EH&S professionals that work in higher education. Um, and we mentioned some of that, you know, we, we, I, mm -hmm. we know some people in that, mm -hmm. that, that world. The other, the last thing is not last but least, but the actual companies that service, the vendors that are picking up waste and their associations are pretty, are very active in this, you know. Uh, doing webinars or updating, you know, uh, taking leadership and trying to help understand this. This is pretty, you know, this is pretty common. You know, what, if you have inspections, can they be brief and un unannounced, comprehensive? Yes, to any or all of those things. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, um, I'll tell you about one in a second here. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I'm working out in New England state mm -hmm. was an announced virtual inspection. So the mm -hmm. hospital leadership got an email from the state inspector saying, we are doing what we call a comprehensive environmental audit of your facility. We are not coming on site. Here's a three pages of bullet points of information we would like you to gather and send to us. The clock starts today. Ooh. And that's where I was last Monday, Tuesday, my head spinning. Was that an emergency? Hey, Daryl, get, get to Boston or were you already scheduled there? No, this was a this was a separate. Ah, okay. Yeah, it it it, it it's been, it is what it is. Yeah, you know, uh, we're doing what we can and helping where we can, uh, but ultimately they have to submit information. If it's there, it's there. It's not, it's not. Um, and then again, uh, at any kind of facility, the employees or any department can be asked anything. Uh, so th that particular request of information covered a lot of stuff. I mean, there was underground storage tank, there was uh, boilers and Clean Air Act information, there was hazardous waste, universal waste, training records, DOT training, you know, I, it was pretty comprehensive. Wow. Uh, the next one, and people have seen this before, this is sort of, this is what inspectors look for, uh, training records. You know, they ask for training records for the various departments at this particular facility. Um, you know, do they do inspections of their storage rooms, all that kind of stuff. So this is common kind of violations. And that information dump, which I'm going to call it, to mm -hmm. the agency is going to be large. And I, I'd hate to be the agent trying to go through that. <laughs> but there's someone's going to do it. So at the end here, sort of more like program management solutions, what I see. Uh, when I think of an executive team, it's sort of the management of the building or the management of the company mm -hmm. or a region. And what they think about in terms of you know risk management from a regulatory standpoint. And then it's, oh, got to go to the next one. I'm oh, sorry. The scale on the left is sort of like um, as you get higher into like pharmaceuticals and solvents and kind of the higher risk wastes, your requirements are increasing. Your costs are more. Your training things are more. So this this is sort of a, a, a scale of yeah everybody has trash right mm -hmm. and it's it's easy pretty easy to manage the ultimately as a business and as an agency or someone that I'm inspecting that facility is you want to put things in the right container for the right reasons right and, and you keep working on this um, let's go on to the next one so then from a what I would call lessons learned from kind of department level folks within hospitals and within uh, educational institutions and perhaps to some degree retailers, they're not going to have all these uh, departments. Uh, but, you know, as you're developing a program and you know about the compliance, you really need to bring in all the pieces. Mm -hmm. um, part of the working with this hospital, just going through this inspection, virtual inspection in, out in New England was uh, the lab had done a, I mean, pretty sophisticated and robust um, program for mm -hmm. managing the lab waste 
but they didn't really incorporate what was happening in pharmacy or facilities or used oil or mm. all the other parts. And you, so it missed out on things. They're really sharp on that one part because they knew their stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but as a individual that runs that facility, um, you're going to think about it as a building. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't just have one department doing their own thing and the rest of it's ignored because the agency is looking at the building. Right. Um, so I, this is sort of kind of common sense is to centralize management is, is to the degree that you can. And, and if you think about it from the retail side with the number of locations that they could have around the country in various states, that's going to be very difficult. So you maybe you want to pick up, you know, pick the states that are more aggressive or more mm -hmm. enforcement scrutiny or pick uh, states that have like regulations, you know, mm -hmm. or look in also look at like the waste streams that are really more risk to your employees and compliance. And, you know, if there's a failure, like a spill, what would be the worst case scenario? And then kind of the last year is how do you do any kind of like internal auditing? Do you do checklists or do you do audits? Do you, I mean, I've done, I, I don't even know how many environmental audits in my life. Um, so, you know, working in factories and refineries mm -hmm. and chemical plants, going in and doing a true environmental audit, I'm there for four days. Uh, it, it doesn't happen in some of these, you wouldn't need to be four days at a hospital. Mm -hmm. So uh, kind of at the end here on uh, program management and some suggestions, we talked about the recent regulation changes. In general, all those changes that are adopting or coming are, are gonna help simplify hazardous waste management for all generators. So that's a good thing. Um, we mentioned a little bit about the agencies and due to COVID from their ability to do enforcement uh, or inspections. Uh, I think there's gonna be more, they will, you know, they're, they're not going to go on site. They're going to send a request for information saying, we are essentially doing an audit of you. Here's what we're going to need to look at. And then here's a time period for you to generate that information for mm -hmm. us. And they, they literally did have a time frame. I think it was like a two and a half weeks, maybe 12 days or something. Wow. Um, and then kind of at the, you know, no matter what else else is happening in the world, whether it's, you know, infection or <laughs> elections or whatever, mm -hmm. you, the waste is still there. They're still being generated. And, you have to sort of know what you need to comply with. And so then I break out like higher education. I, I think it's just more of a observation because I've worked a little bit in that, not as much as I worked in the healthcare or the other industries, but um, they essentially have some good internal and external resources and staff. They sort of got, you know, they, they know who, what they do and they, they have some ability to manage it themselves internally with some skills and some uh, individuals. So they kind of staff it the right way. Uh, they do have challenges and obviously keeping up with chemicals, like what is new chemicals coming on the building? Well, waste determinations. And then with these regulation changes, how do we modify what we're doing so that we, yeah, modify it to, to take advantage of that. And kind of the last one here is the hospital and healthcare and retail sector. I sort of lump them together because in, relatively compared to the industrial sectors or even higher ed, um, the expertise in terms of environmental staff is is is, is lacking. I mean, it, in some cases, it's got some there, or it changes a lot, or most of the time, I see it's worn by the the environmental hat is broken into ten chunks. And it's worn by fifteen people, mm -hmm. and so no one is really in charge of the whole thing. Uh, the pharma rule is going to take some time to implement because if you just choose to just, we're going to set up our program according to that. You have to make changes on how you're managing the pharmaceutical waste now to do that, which you have to maybe retrain, get different containers, could be reporting differences. Uh, but in general, if they, you can do that, you, that's a good thing to do that. And it also applies to the retail pharmacy sector. So lastly, kind of the, what would you, how would you track, you know, I think the biggest thing is tracking where your relations and what they mean. And, and again, I would go to the, you know, people like us that have environmental, you know, consulting skills. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do this for remediation, for investigations, auditing, compliance, environmental health and safety, you know, OSHA. We, we have that. We know what's going on in the states that we work with. Um, then you go to the agencies, including the EPA, and I've given some links on there. And then I would also tie in the business sector and the professional associations that I'm a part of some. There are really good ones. And they cover parts of this. And even, even the waste companies do a lot to help their customers. Yeah, because they've seen it before and it's easier yep. to, to, this worked. We had this similar, similar situation in this company and we can do it here. And yeah. 
So we're kind of at the end, Lance, and I. Wow, I, that was fast. Yeah, that was a fast I'm, hour. I'm dry. <laughs> Uh, but these are the kind of the main topics we covered, um, and and we can drill into any of these in more detail. Uh, but it's it, uh, it's it's an interesting area to work in. Um, regulations keep you on your toes. Yeah. And and uh, and then you have you know again either the announced or unannounced inspections that happen, and and it's kind of like a fire mm -hmm. fire drill to, to get the paperwork together. Wow. Um, and again, I've seen there's probably. And I told the people out in um, uh, uh, New England, um, there's things that they're going through, I've seen somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just a matter of now we got to get our arms around it and work through the, the process yeah. to get them up. Yeah. And and I know there's, uh, in looking at some of the regulations being sitting in on the record classes, there's there's a lot of, there's a, things change with the littlest and or, but, you know, and or buts. And you got to really make sure you watch those because it's, you know, you got to, Kind of pay attention so it can change even you know in that in that paragraph it can be interpreted different meanings so we are running a little short on time uh so i do have there were, there's a few questions but i'm going to make sure that daryl gets them in in response uh to to you guys but i did want to clarify one thing is on the record training that we we're doing it is going to be several states not it's not just going to be one state specific so we are going to generalize it so it's so don't worry that if you're like hey because normally we it's been Texas, but now we're going to do them all nine, eleven states. So uh, I just wanted to clarify that as well. Our next webinar is uh, on October twenty second. It's um, going to be the Highway to Help Environmental Compliance for Transportation Projects. You got to sign up for this webinar just for the fact that they have an AC. They reference an ACDC song, so we're <laughs> we're really excited for that one. Uh, Jackie Dyla is going to be uh, uh, our expert on that one. So, well, Daryl, thanks so much for joining us. It sure. was a great webinar, a lot of information, and I know that uh, you love it. But uh, it, it's a, it's a someone uh, has to love someone it. Someone has to do it. That's right. So, but uh, thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next time. Hopefully, next time. So. Um, so, so that includes our webinar and you guys have a great, actually it's like second day of fall, if you can believe that. So happy second day of fall. So y'all have a great day.